烧，因人生，卡埃拉人，阿萨卡哈拉人，扎卡拉人，烧爱因人生。Namaste. Welcome to Shrimad Devi Bhagavatam. The Sanskrit verse you just heard is the Sodashi Mantra. Sodashi Mantra is the most powerful and beneficial Vedic prayer. It invokes the Shakti of Goddess Lalita, also known as Tripura Sundari, Mahamaya. Durga and many other names. Who is Goddess Lalita? This Shrimad Devi Bhagavatam is her story. Listen, and you will gain immense spiritual benefit. The Rishis said, "O Sutta, our minds are merged in a sea of doubt." Hearing this, your most wonderful saying, surprising to the whole world, the head of Janardhan Madhava, the Lord of all, was severed from his body, and he was afterwards known as Hayagriva, the horse-faced. Oh, what more wonder can there be than this? Whom the Vedas even praise, whom all the devas rest on, who is the cause of all causes. The Adi Deva Jagannath, Lord of the Universe. Oh, how is it that his head came to be severed? Oh, highly intelligent one, describe all this to us in detail. Namaste. <laughs> the Vedas are wild. The Puranas are even wilder. <laughs> But Devi Bhagavatam has got it nailed. These are all the back stories. If you want to know how things came to be the way they are, why the universe exists, how it is created, maintained, and destroyed, what is the power behind all the forms of the different gods, and so on, it's all explained here in Devi Bhagavatam. So the Devi Bhagavatam is like the backstory; it's like the origin story of the Vedic religion, and therefore we can understand, to analyze historically, that the cult of the Devi, of the goddess, the supreme goddess, existed before any of the later sectarian religions like Vaishnavism. Shaivism and so on. That, in other words, there are different different forms of demigods who manage the various aspects of the creation, from、uh, creating it in the beginning to maintaining it in the middle and destroying it at the end. And like the weather,、uh, Indra is in charge of rain. Varuna is in charge of the waters and the oceans and so on. So there are many, many different aspects of God, the controller, and they each have their own separate individuality and traits, and so on, their personalities and whatever. But behind them all is the goddess, because she is the Saguna Brahman, the absolute with qualities. Whereas Sada Shiva is the absolute, the Nirguna Brahman, without qualities. So they are not separate; they are non-different; they are one, but simply showing different faces, depending on whether the creation is currently manifested or not. Even the form of Shiva. Is actually Devi. She is everything. She is time and space and energy and consciousness. Even 
Consciousness is fundamental. Without consciousness, you can't have anything else. So the Devi, she's known as the, the Turiya Chaitanya Rupa. She is the form of the highest state of consciousness, that state of consciousness in which the other states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, are the objects. So by her grace, we get liberation. I mean, she is Maya. She is what is trapping us in this material world. So she can also give liberation. So anyway, the sages are really, uh, their minds are blown. How is it possible, they say, that Vishnu got his head cut off? So <laughs> you see, all these stories show that these great demigods, I mean, they're very powerful, very intelligent, highly spiritual, and so on, but they're not independent. They're not all perfect. They're very perfect, but they're not completely perfect. Huh? They can still have so many difficulties. So let's go on. Sutta said, O Munis, hear all attentively the glorious deeds of the supremely energetic Vishnu, the Deva of the Devas. Once upon a time, the eternal Deva Janardana became tired after the terrible continuous battle for 10,000 years. After this, the Lord Narayana seated himself in Padmasana in some lovely place on a level plot of ground and placing his head on the front of his bow with the bow strung and placed erect on the ground, fell fast asleep. Vishnu, the lord of Rama, was exceedingly tired, and thus he fell soon into deep sleep. At this time, Indra and the other devas, with Brahma and Mahesh, began a sacrifice. Then they, for the sake of success, went to the region of Vaikuntha to meet with the Deva Janardana, the Lord of Sacrifices. There the Devas, not finding Vishnu, came to know by dhyana, meditation, where Bhagavan Vishnu was staying, and thither they went. They saw that the Lord Vishnu, the Deva of the Devas, was lying unconscious, being in the arms of Yoga Nidra. Therefore, they took their seats there. Seeing the Lord of the universe asleep, Brahma, Rudra, and the other devas became anxious. So the demigods aren't independent. They depend on Vishnu. When they want to perform a sacrifice, even Brahma and Mahesh, or Shiva, have to go to Vishnu to get authorization, to get his permission and his cooperation. Otherwise, the sacrifice won't be successful. So they went there and they found him in Yoga Nidra. Now, what is Yoga Nidra? Yoga Nidra is also known as Turiya, this highest state of consciousness. Externally, it looks like sleep. It looks like the body is deep asleep with no external awareness, similar to Samadhi. But within, the being is aware of all the different states of consciousness. And we can also experience this Turiya, and we should. But the way it works <laughs> is that we have to approach the Devi. We have to approach the Goddess. We cannot do it by our own efforts. This is very important to understand because it's the key to success. Otherwise, you're just going to keep knocking your head against a wall, not getting anywhere. And we see this again and again. People try to meditate, and they try and try and try, and they don't get anywhere. Simply, their mind is all over the universe <laughs> like that. And the reason for that is that they don't approach the Supreme Goddess. She is consciousness. So if you want to change your consciousness, or if you want to even collect your attention, your, your awareness, and focus it on one thing, as required by meditation, you need her help. 
Just like the demigods need Vishnu's help to perform their sacrifices so they can do their jobs. So when the, the demigods found Vishnu asleep, they said, oh, how are we going to complete our sacrifice so that we can create, maintain, and destroy whatever needs to be created, maintained, and destroyed in the universe? So then what happened? Indra then addressed the devas. O oh, best of the suras, now what is to be done? How shall we rouse Bhagavan from his sleep? Now think of the means by which this can be effected. Hearing Indra's words, Shambhu said, O oh, good devas, now we must finish our sacrificial work. But if the sleep of Bhagavan be disturbed, he would get angry. Hearing Shankara's words, Parameshti Brahma created Vamri insects, a sort of white ants, so that they might eat up the forepart of the bow that was lying on the ground, causing the other end to rise up and thus break his sleep. Now, here's, here's a perfect example of misguided intelligence. <laughs> Brahma has the power to create any kind of life. He gets this power from Vishnu, and Vishnu gets that power from Devi, from Shakti. So he's thinking, now I can create this life form, and, and they will wake up Vishnu. So if he becomes angry and curses the one who woke him, he'll curse these insignificant insects and leave us alone. <laughs> but wait till you see what happens. Brahma's plan kind of backfires. Thus, the deva's purpose would, no doubt, be fulfilled. Thus, settling his mind, the eternal deva, Brahma, ordered the Vamris to cut the bowstring. Hearing this order of Brahma, the Vamris spoke to Brahma thus, O Brahma, how can I disturb the sleep of the deva deva, the lord of Lakshmi, the world guru? To rouse one from one's deep sleep, to interrupt one in one's speech, to sever the love between a couple, husband and wife, to separate a child from his mother. All these are equivalent to Brahmahatya, murdering a Brahmana. Now this is a very intelligent little bug, huh? <laughs> Vamri, I guess they're sort of like termites. They can chew through anything hard, but they're questioning Brahma that, you know, this is a sinful act. And it's very educational, the things that he compares it to. Awakening one from deep sleep is a sin. Why? Because in deep sleep, we are in the arms of Brahman. And this is how we recharge. This is how we overcome the fatigue of the struggle for existence. And without this deep sleep, we, we go crazy. Literally, sleep experimenters have found us. If you wake up somebody in the middle of deep sleep and keep them from going into it again, after a few days, they just go nuts. So, awakening from one from deep sleep to interrupt one's speech. This is also sinful. And I know this, this happens to me all the time. I'll be talking about something, some deep point on philosophy, Vedic philosophy, and the person I'm talking to will just interrupt me, like right in the middle of a sentence. I'm like, you know, what, <laughs> why am I even bothering with this idiot? You know, one should respect speech, vak. Vak means speech. And when speech is used to uh, clarify the points of the Vedas or to worship the highest demigods and God, huh? Shiva, Shakti, and like that. It should not be interrupted. Otherwise, this is a sinful act. One should allow the person to complete their thought. Otherwise, it means that you're not really listening to them. You're not really respecting them as a being. You know, you're just anxious to say whatever you have to say. So this is a, this is a very kind of sociopathic 
mood and therefore sinful. What else? To separate the love between a husband and wife or to separate a child from a mother. These are all sins equivalent to killing a brahmana. Brahmahatya, that's a pretty severe sin. So these are all things that we should watch out for and a gentle person, a conscious person does not do them. Therefore, O Deva, how can I interrupt the happiness of sleep of the Deva Deva? And what benefit shall I derive by eating the bowstring so that I may incur this vicious act? But a man can commit a sin if there be any interest of his. I am ready to eat this if I get a personal interest. Brahma said, We will give you to share in this our yajna, sacrifice. So hear me. Do our work and rouse Vishnu from his sleep. During the time of performing Homa, whatever ghee will fall outside the Homa Kunda, the sacrificial pit, will fall to your share. So be quick and do this. Sutta said, Thus ordered by Brahma, the Vamri insect soon ate away the fore end of the bow that rested on the ground. Immediately the string gave way and the bow went up. The other end became free and a terrible sound took place. The devas became afraid. The whole universe got agitated. The earth trembled. The sea became swollen. The aquatic animals became startled. Violent wind blew. The mountains shook. Ominous meteors fell. The quarters assumed a terrific aspect. The sun went down the horizon. In that time of distress, the devas became anxious what evil might come down. O oh, ascetics, while the devas were thus cogitating, the head with crown on it of the deva deva Vishnu vanished away, and nobody knew where it fell. When the awful darkness disappeared, Brahma and Mahadeva saw the disfigured body of Vishnu with its head off. Seeing that headless figure of Vishnu, they were greatly surprised. They were drowned in the ocean of cares and, overwhelmed with grief, began to weep aloud. O oh Lord, O oh Master, O oh Deva Deva, O oh Eternal One, what unforeseen extraordinary mishap occurred to us today? O oh Deva, thou canst not be pierced nor cut asunder nor capable of being burnt. How is it then that thy head has been taken away? Is this the Maya magic of some Deva? O oh, all-pervading one, the Devas cannot live when thy condition is thus. We do not know what affection thou dost have towards us. We are crying because of our selfish ends. Perhaps this, therefore, has occurred. The Daityas, Yakshas, or Rakshasas have not done this. O Lord of Lakshmi, whose fault will we ascribe this to? The Devas themselves have committed this loss to themselves? O Lord of the Devas, the Devas are not independent. They are under thee. Now, where are we to go? What are we to do? There was none to save us dull, stupid Devas. So Brahma's brilliant plan didn't quite work out the way he thought. <laughs> Instead, this great darkness came. And in the darkness, when the bowstring snapped, it took off Vishnu's head and cast it far away. So now there's like, oh no, you know, <laughs> now we've done it. So you see, this is what happens when we try to approach the Supreme by our own dull intelligence. This is exactly why we should take shelter of the Devas. You see, instead of waiting for Vishnu to wake up, they came up with their own solution and now look what happened. Things got a hundred times worse. 
And this is exactly what happens when we try to live life by our own lights. Let's face it, we're not that bright. How many times have we tried to anticipate something happening in the future and we've been wrong? Huh? Who can count the number of times? Innumerable times. So our intelligence is covered by illusion. We're in Maya, okay? The fact that we think, I am this body, I am a human being, I am a man, I am a woman, I am this, I am a that. This is all a hunkar, false ego. And because of false ego, we cannot see things the way they are. Our view is always biased, it's always slanted. It's never objective, it's never pure. So our intelligence is covered by this ahankar, this false ego, and because of this, we are always wrong. Therefore, we have to take shelter of the scriptures. We have to take shelter of the Vedic authorities. Then our knowledge can be perfect. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.